Good evening. Good evening. I'm Paul Caris, the director of this new academic unit at Arizona State University, the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. And it's my honor to welcome you to this inaugural event in a year-long series of lectures and discussions and dialogues on the theme of free speech and intellectual diversity in higher education and American society. We are delighted at the school to be co-sponsoring this entire series with two ASU partners, the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication and the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. And as you can see, we are in studio, so we also have as a partner Arizona PBS, and I'll explain some of the complexities of our event this evening because we're recording this for uh, later airing. The School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership is convening leading experts on free speech and a broader array of civic and intellectual leaders in American life to explore the new wave of heated debates and clashes on American campuses about freedom of speech, civility, diversity, and inclusion. Recent episodes of violence and the widespread concern about a narrowed range of discourse on many university campuses are, of course, vitally important issues for educators. And given the importance of higher education for American politics and our civic fabric, these are significant issues for all citizens. The school thus plans to collect all the presentations from this year-long series, the individual lectures, the dialogue events, and our February conference into a published, edited book. And as you can see, we're also happy to announce that we are collaborating with Arizona PBS on recording several of the events in the series to be aired later in the year. Uh, just a brief word more about the mission of this new school, and then I'll introduce our speakers. The School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership is dedicated to reviving the crucial link between civic education and liberal education in order to prepare thoughtful leaders for civil society and for public service. We believe that the study of great works and great debates of civic, economic, political, and moral thought, supplemented by internships and public events like this to provide experiences about leadership and statesmanship, provide an excellent foundation for both understanding and practicing leadership in the 21st century world and 21st century America. We also think a return to some fundamental ideas and debates might provide a broader and calming perspective in our polarized and divided times. Surely one of the fundamental recurring debates of American life across many centuries is the meaning of freedom of speech, both as a legal and political principle and regarding its role in educational settings. I'm very glad to have as one of our partners in planning this entire series, Professor Joseph Russomano, who has taught at the Cronkite School here at ASU since 1994. I'll first introduce Joe, and then he, in turn, will introduce our main speaker. Professor Russomano's career includes work as a television journalist in Denver and doctoral study at the University of Colorado Boulder, focusing on legal and political theory about the First Amendment and mass communication. This has been his continued scholarly focus, and he, therefore, also is an affiliate faculty member of the O'Connor College of Law at ASU. Now, the format of the evening is a little bit complex, as fits the complexity of our topic. So our main speaker will make uh, initial remarks, and then Professor Russomano will undertake a conversation with Mr. Abrams, thus the chairs. And finally, we'll have time for questions and discussion with the audience. Later, uh, we'll take a break, and we'll bring out some um, microphones in the middle aisle. So at this point, please join me in welcoming Professor Russomano. Thank you, Paul. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, my privilege and honor to be moderating this uh, event tonight. And I can think of no better way to kick it off uh, this entire series, that is, uh, than with our guest tonight. When you're tasked with, someone, uh, with introducing someone like Floyd Abrams, I've discovered that the challenge is not so much where to begin, but where to end. So as I consider this challenge, I had this thought, and that is, if you, were to, if you were asked to compile a list of the people who have most directly impacted the positive evolution of the First Amendment, its rights in this country over the 20th and now into the 21st century, 
possibly aside from Supreme, some Supreme Court justices, and maybe not even all of them, I don't think anyone rises to the top of that list more quickly than our guest tonight. Supporting this premise is another First Amendment attorney, Lee Levine, who wrote, the modern history of the freedom of the press in this country is intimately associated with the career and work of Floyd Abrams. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan once characterized Mr. Abrams as the most significant First Amendment lawyer of our age. Rod Smola, a noted First Amendment scholar, said, Floyd Abrams is the greatest free speech advocate of modern times. And the First Amendment Center, appropriately enough, has said that his name is synonymous with the First Amendment in a way that virtually no other name is. So you get the idea. An advocate for speech and press rights, Floyd Abrams has argued and won some of the most important First Amendment cases ever at the US Supreme Court. From the Pentagon Papers, to Nebraska Press Association, to Citizens United, he was there. Looking at his cases is almost synonymous with running through those in a mass communication law course. In fact, in a course of mine by that title, there may not be a name that comes up more often with the exception of those like Madison, Holmes, Brandeis, and Brennan. Speaking of Justice Brennan, our guest tonight has twice earned awards with Justice Brennan's name on them, as well as many, many others. Mr. Abrams is also the author of several books. In his latest, called The Soul of the First Amendment, he writes that the United States protects speech more often, more intensely, and more controversially than anywhere else in the world. But there may be one venue that stands out as an exception to that, where the threat to free speech looms large. I have a feeling we're about to hear about that. Ladies and gentlemen, Floyd Abrams. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's really an honor for me to be here uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, to begin this uh, series of lectures uh, at a time when uh, the country desperately needs to be thinking about free speech and intellectual diversity. Um, it is also for me because uh, I knew Walter Cronkite a bit, not so well, but a bit. Uh, but I knew him better, as most Americans did, as the signal journalist, speaker, uh, articulator uh, of the news and of the values and nature of journalism in, in America. And since I'm touting everyone I know, <laughs> I did argue in front of Justice O'Connor in one of her first arguments in which I had the misfortune of referring to her as Sir. <laughs> she was the first woman ever to sit on the Supreme Court, and I wasn't used to it. Uh, but she served the country well with uh, dignity uh, and uh, reason. Uh, my topic tonight relates to uh, freedom of speech on campuses college campuses, university campuses, uh, and the like. And it is a topic which is, of course, <clears throat> much discussed these days, often uh, at commencement uh, addresses in which speakers are concerned that they will be hooted down uh, if they say anything too offensive to some of the people listening to it. Uh, there are such an abundance of examples of speech being avoided by invitations to speakers being withdrawn because of objections voiced by students, mostly students, and of speeches literally uh, uh, being canceled midstream 
because speakers were interrupted with, uh, not heckled, but, but made it impossible for speakers to continue uh, because of the noise uh, and, and the like. Um, I cited a number of examples of these and some testimony I gave recently before the Senate Judiciary Committee and it's almost too easy to start listing different examples of some of the problems that are, are the unavoidably before us on campuses uh, today. I referred there to campuses on which speech uh, with which some students uh, disagreed very strongly had been effectively uh, stifled. Evergreen, Middlebury, of course, Berkeley, uh, the home of free speech activism some years ago, and now too often of anti-free speech activism. Uh, I mentioned individuals generally on the right, more often than not on the pretty far right, uh, who views those appearance on some campuses has been so off-putting as to drive uh, too many people to a desire to keep them from speaking instead of responding or not attending uh, or the like. Uh, there is a distinguished array of individuals who've been invited to speak at universities around the country where the universities decided they eventually had to withdraw the invitation before the speech was to occur for fear of incurring uh, the wrath of uh, some of the listeners. Uh, Christine Lagarde, the first woman to head the International Monetary Fund, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, uh, George Will, uh, I could give a, a long list. And I referred to some colleges and universities that had behaved in ways that I thought were particularly uh, speech destructive, but I thought they deserved some special recognition. Uh, one was California State University in Los Angeles, whose president canceled a speech by the editor of Breitbart, the conservative publication, uh, for better or worse, increasing notoriety as Steve Bannon's name has become ever more ubiquitous. The speech was titled, When Diversity Becomes a Problem, and the explanation offered by the president for the cancellation was, quote, the need for free exchange of ideas. The president's position was that the speaker could appear only as part of a panel rather than to speak individually. Treatment totally at odds from that afforded to speakers uh, of the far left who had appeared and spoken. I hope I don't really don't have to say that limiting speech to participation in a panel is hardly an endorsement of the notion that free speech means the chance to give a speech uh, freely. Since my testimony, actually at the testimony I gave, I learned of another example worth recalling one of the other witnesses was Zach Wood, an undergraduate at Williams, who had organized a series of talks under the heading Uncomfortable Learning. He had invited John Derbyshire, a very controversial author of works on what he called race realism, to speak. Upon learning this, the president of Williams simply canceled the speech, disinvited Mr. Derbyshire saying there's a line somewhere and Derbyshire, in my opinion, is on the other side of it. Uh, that decision uh, by the president of Williams led some senators to say some harsh things about him and led uh, the organization called FIRE, the organization that seeks to protect free speech on campuses, uh, to put Williams on its list of the 10 worst colleges for freedom of speech in 2017. It also led me to do some more thinking about the topic. I thought I'd mention to you a lawsuit just filed last week 
uh, against Michigan State University. Richard Spencer is a white supremacist uh, of views that I consider to be ugly in nature, and I am not at all alone in thinking that. He has received a good deal of notoriety in recent months. Uh, he was invited to speak at Michigan State, which chose not to rent him a room for the speech. The reason given by the university was security, what it characterized as significant concerns about public safety in wake of the tragic violence in Charlottesville. Uh, Spencer's lawsuit argues that neither he nor the organizer of the speaking tour had ever been charged or convicted of any crime and neither uh, advocated violence. Now, uh, let me be clear, it's very easy to mock some of the speech destructive activities that have occurred on too many campuses. And I've engaged in that mockery and disparagement occasionally. And one of my favorites relates to students at Emory, you may have read about this, who were so appalled before the election to wake up and find chalk endorsements of Donald Trump for president on the ground that they sounded as if they had been virtually stricken and unable to function. The school offered them psychiatric uh, care to deal uh, with, the, with the problem. Um, but I offer no mockery of Michigan State and the other public universities, Auburn, Louisiana State, the University of Florida, Texas A&M, Penn State, that sought to cope with the risks of violence by declining to permit Spencer to appear on their campus. It's not irrelevant that he and hundreds of other so-called white nationalists and white separatists marched in Charlottesville with torches and had angry confrontations with counter-protesters. It's not irrelevant that a woman died in Charlottesville and that many were injured. It's not irrelevant, but it is not sufficient to bar him from speaking on a public campus. And while it's not a basis, because security problems are real when Mr. Spencer appears, it is not a basis for ridiculing those colleges and universities for seeking to avoid the risks of violence. There's a very strong basis for a court to rule, as I think it likely will, that Spencer's speech must be allowed unless there is strong reason to believe that what he has to say meets the deliberately difficult test of incitement to criminal conduct. There is one case directly on point, and it was at Auburn, and I fully agree with the ruling of federal judge W. Keith Watkins in that case uh, against Auburn. Uh, in which the judge said discrimination on the basis of message content cannot be tolerated under the First Amendment. That being so, Judge Watkins concluded, the speech must be permitted and campuses must take adequate security precautions to prevent violence, which is what Auburn did, urging students who were understandably outraged at Spencer's racist message to engage in counter speech or no speech, to come or to stay away, but not to behave in a violent fashion. It's worth thinking about, I think, why we protect such speech, and indeed why we protect it as other democratic countries do not. A country as committed to democracy and freedom as Canada would not protect Spencer's speech. Indeed, his speech would be deemed to violate Canadian law, which bars and criminalizes the sort of hate speech involved. And the same is true in most of democratic Western Europe. In a, re in a recent Canadian case, a religious uh, zealot was so offended by the decision of the province of Saskatchewan to teach about homosexuality in high schools that he prepared printed flyers 
which he put in mailboxes around town. Uh, for those of you that have never heard of a mailbox or a flyer, <laughs> uh, your grandfather can tell you. Uh, so he put these flyers in at just about every mailbox he could find, and he denounced the school system for teaching it and basically, not even implicitly, explicitly, denounced everyone who was gay. He said that the, that the school was going to teach buggery to high school students. It was insulting and it was demeaning about any homosexual and in truth about everyone. He was convicted in Canada of the crime of hate speech under a statute that bars speech that, quote, ridicules, belittles, or otherwise affronts the dignity of any person or class of persons. The Canadian Supreme Court affirmed the conviction, stating that hate speech lays the groundwork for later broad attacks on vulnerable groups that can range from discrimination to ostracism, segregation, deportation, violence, and in the most extreme cases, to genocide. That's a serious opinion. It is profoundly un-American in the sense that our law is flatly inconsistent with that approach. Uh, we talked about this in uh, a class I uh, spoke at today, but it's, it's worth going over again that when the group known as the Westboro Baptist Church uh, learns of a military funeral of an American soldier killed in Iraq or Afghanistan, they frequently stand as close to the church or other religious institution as they're permitted to with vile signs attacking, even celebrating the death and saying that it was justified because of this country's supposedly too tolerant treatment of homosexuals. The signs are filled with language such as these. Thank God for dead soldiers. God hates fags. Fags doom nations and the like. When the father of one of the soldiers died, uh, sued, the US Supreme Court, in an eight to one opinion written by Chief Justice John Roberts, observed that far from such ugly speech being unprotected by the First Amendment, that it was entitled to special protection because however distasteful, it, it related to matters of public concern and could not be restricted simply, quote, because it is upsetting or arouses contempt. And while the Canadian court concluded that hate speech quote, does little to promote the values underlying freedom of expression, the American Supreme Court said, in effect, that the ultimate First Amendment value is the avoidance of government censorship of speech without regard to what a judge decides is the worth of the speech itself. And that is the central lesson of the First Amendment. It is what Justice Hugo Black of the Supreme Court had in mind when he wrote that the very reason for the First Amendment is to make people of the country free to think, speak, write, and worship as they wish, not as the government commands. It is what Justice Robert Jackson had in mind when he wrote that the very purpose of the First Amendment is to foreclose public authority from assuming a guardianship of the public mind through regulating the press, speech, and religion. I want to turn now to a somewhat broader issue. Uh, in late May of this year, uh, CNN commentator Fareed Zakaria said some very interesting things about our topic tonight in a speech he gave at uh, Bucknell University and on CNN. Most broadly, he maintained that on campuses around the country, conservative voices and views, this is his language, 
already a besieged minority, are being silenced entirely. While that's a bit overstated, I think it is more correct than not. And Mr. Zakaria was quite right to criticize what he called anti-intellectualism on the left and an attitude of self-righteousness and far too often seeking to suppress on campus views with which others differed. But there's something else he said with which I disagree and which I think it's important to address when we think about freedom of speech on campus. That was the conduct of about 100 or so students at the commencement this last spring at Notre Dame, who when Vice President Pence was giving the commencement address, turned their back and walked out in protest. Mr. Zakaria used this as an example of the closed-minded self-righteousness of the left and unwillingness by students even to listen to views with which they differed. I disagree. Now, I honor those students. To be sure, they chose not to listen to the vice president. But one thing freedom of speech protects is the right to protest against someone else's speech, so long as the protest is expressed in a manner that does not deprive others of the chance to hear and pass upon uh, what is said. The decision by Notre Dame students to protest by peacefully walking out sent the very message that the students intended to send and, in my view, had every right to send. And it is a message that is entirely consistent with the First Amendment. They deserve, in my view, praise, not condemnation, for caring enough about public issues to take a stand of their own, just as they did. And in doing so, they did not act inconsistently with a basic precept that set forth recently in a, a brilliant statement of principles of freedom of expression uh, offered by the University of Chicago, which said that, quote, although faculty, students, and staff are free to criticize content and condemn the views expressed on campus, they may not obstruct can, that they may not obstruct, disrupt, or otherwise interfere with the freedom of others to express views they reject or even loathe. There are simply too many examples of that, not the Notre Dame example, but of that sort of interference, such as one at San Francisco State University, where anti-Israeli students literally prevented the mayor of Jerusalem from speaking by the use of amplified sound and loud and virulent anti-Semitic chants. That behavior, it seems to me, was not only unconscionable, but at odds with any notion of protecting freedom of speech. And a university that countenanced such conduct is worthy of condemnation, and San Francisco State deserves the lawsuit that has been brought against it as a result. There's so much the First Amendment prevents, with good reason, from public colleges and universities from doing, that I want to close with a word or two about what they may do. And let me just add a, a legal word or two in the midst. I've been referring to public universities because the First Amendment only applies to public universities. It does not apply to private universities any more than to other private places or institutions. But most universities, and all of the really good and great ones, have said that they choose to be, they choose to follow First Amendment principles. And so while, when they act badly, in my view, in this respect, they're not violating the law, they are violating to their own principles. I wanted to close with a reference to a, a moment uh, some years ago uh, when a former roommate of mine at my law firm, when we were both uh, very young, uh, actually not very young, when we were both younger, uh, uh, 
uh, called me and asked a question. He had left the practice of law and become president of a highly regarded and quite small liberal arts college in rural uh, America. At a basketball game that his college was involved in, racial taunts had been heard from undergraduates from his school directed at players on the opposing team. He called to chat with me and to ask what I thought he should do. I, I said, well, what did you do? He said, I called them in. He said, I told them what they had said was racist, bigoted, inconsistent with the values of the college. He said, I yelled at them. He said, I insisted that they publicly apologize. He said, I warned them about such conduct. And he asked me, was there anything else I thought of that he ought to uh, do? And I suggested that he speak publicly about it to the entire college, making clear just what the values of the college were. He did so, and, and uh, I, I have no doubt he would have done so without my advice. Thinking that, I, I was especially pleased to read just last week uh, um, a book uh, called Free Speech on Campus by Orwin Chemerinsky and Howard Gilman, in which they said the following, a campus should expect university administrators to speak out against especially egregious speech acts, and more important, encourage the university community to make its own decisions about which speech acts deserve praise or condemnation. Uh, I'm sure of the correctness of the first clause uh, in that statement. Uh, it is necessary sometimes for a university which allows, as it should, uh, offensive and even potentially harmful, certainly psychically harmful, a speech for the university to speak out on its own behalf, speaking as a university or speaking as the president uh, of a university. As for encouraging the university community to make its own decision about which speech acts deserve praise or condemnation, I think that will follow uh, in the ordinary uh, course. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it is the university community as a community which must make the ultimate decisions uh, about whether speech which is allowed and for the most part has to be allowed should be praised, ignored, or condemned. And I think in this, at this time, with the sort of speech which uh, individuals are seeking to utter on campus, that uh, it is very important not only that the universities, the colleges, the administration speak out, uh, but that the students uh, do so as well. Not to keep the speech from occurring, but to make clear their disassociation from it and their contempt uh, of it. Thank you all very much. OK, everyone, welcome back uh, as we get underway here. Um, I wanted to start off uh, this uh, portion of our program uh, by reiterating uh, something I mentioned in my earlier remarks, and that's a, a quote of yours from uh, your book, The Soul of the First Amendment, where, uh, again, you write uh, that the United States protects speech more often, more intensely, and more controversially than is true elsewhere. So two questions uh, to begin. Why? And uh, why, why that level of protection? And most importantly, as it applies to our context today, should that extend to college campuses? From a historical point of view, 
the answer to the why question uh, is the level of distrust that the framers had and others have had throughout American history for uh, government involvement, oversight, engagement almost with uh, uh, these areas of uh, uh, speech, press, religion. Um, uh, there is, as I try to indicate, uh, another route which is a perfectly rational one but is, is deeply antithetical to the, the way our country has gone, uh, and that is to allow a, a level of uh, punishment to be inflicted about speech which is viewed as essentially antisocial and uh, potentially harmful. Uh, our, you know, our Supreme Court opinions, uh, some of which purport to be rooted in American history, some of which are simply uh, uh, the best the, uh, the, the jurist could do in trying to extract the spirit of the First Amendment from those very few words. I mean, I mean bear in mind, we're talking about eight words here. Yeah, uh, no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press is, is the main thing we, I've been talking about tonight. Uh, so, uh, you know, by itself it doesn't answer a lot of questions, and it answers very few hard questions. But uh, the direction that we, we have chosen is one which tries to avoid some of those hard questions by giving, I don't want to say easy answers, but <coughs> more predictable answers than would be the case uh, in other democratic uh, countries, um, and uh, that's that's where that's how we got where we are. What, what was your second one? Uh, Extending to college campuses. Yeah, uh, it's a problem extending it to college campuses because the function of a college is something different than the function of other institutions uh, in our society. Uh, uh, we would. I mean, a college uh, would feel very free to say, uh, we don't want a flat earth believer to testify on our campus. A college would feel, might feel free uh, to say, we don't want a climate denier uh, on, on our campus because it doesn't have educational value. But the way these cases come up and the way these situations that I was discussing come up is really in situations, almost always, in situations in which it is students who do the inviting and students who do the objecting, uh, where there are organizations, clubs, uh, entities of people who share certain socio-political, cultural views and ask them to come and speak. And campuses have historically been open to those sorts of speeches. Uh, I'll be clear, uh, a, even a public university could say, we're not going to have any speeches. I mean, we, we are not a campus which is open to speeches about anything that's non-academic. Um, but that is not the direction that, that American colleges and universities have gone. Uh, and I think that's a good thing, but that, that they have not gone there. Uh, but but the, the consequence of that, the consequence of saying we will allow a student group to uh, invite uh, uh, the former head of Iran, uh, Ahmadinejad, very controversial for, uh, you know, at a time when we're close to war with Iran and certainly in enormous and direct ideological conflict uh, to, to, to invite him, which could be taken as an honor, to appear at an American college. But, you know, once the universities start down the road of, of having outside speakers, and once they start down the road of having uh, students or, or entities student-filled uh, make those invitations, 
then they're significantly limited in, in their own uh, ability to make content decisions. And most of all, and most clearly of all, they can't do it by allowing only liberal and no conservative speakers or <coughs> vice versa. Uh, uh, it, once once they're, they have, as it were, devoted themselves to having that level of openness. It seems to me that uh, we have moved into maybe considering for a bit the, the purposes of higher education. Uh, I know in your remarks you mentioned the, uh, the policy that the University of Chicago set forth uh, in, in recent years, which is, uh, has been upheld as, as a model in many respects, uh, saying in part that education should not be intended to make people comfortable, it is meant to make them think. Um, preceding this by many years in 1974 was a, a similar report at Yale University which said that the primary function of a university is to discover and disseminate knowledge by means of research and teaching and to fulfill this function a free interchange of ideas is necessary. Um, are those goals being met? Well I think for the most part they, they are. Uh, I'm struck by the uh, by the Yale statement, uh, in particular because it seemed to edge towards that alternative view that I articulated earlier, which is a, you know college is a place for teaching and uh, what was the other word? Uh, Exchange of ideas. Uh, uh, no, be, be, uh, before that it was teaching and studying uh, uh, and the like. Uh, I mean, a college, again, does not have to be a public park. It does not have to si simply say, uh, you know, we're opening ourselves up, uh, glad to have anyone say anything about <laughs> just about anything. Uh, but uh, as I said, once, once, once they start down the road, and, and I think it's worth doing that, but once they start down the road of saying, particularly public one, of saying, you know, we're, we're, we're going to invite so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, but we will not invite speakers with this view or that view, then they're, they're deep in a First Amendment morass. Uh, and and uh, I wouldn't doubt, and I say this without knowledge, that some university presidents must be thinking about that. I mean, why, why do I need this? Why, why do I have to have these problems, and now security problems, no less. Not bruised feelings, not, not just a, a sense of not belonging, which is awful if that's a result of, of having some of these speakers, but, but the universities have to pay and have to risk violence uh, on campus because of the, the state of the nation, as it were, uh, as it is today, uh, and and the, uh, uh, the 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 level of uh, rancor that, that exists and, and concern that exists about allowing a, a certain speech, uh, I, I should add that that what I left out of my prepared remarks is that, that <coughs> there is polling data I indicating that that the younger people are these days in America the less devoted to broad notions of freedom of speech they are, and the more they believe that speech that wounds people <coughs> should not be allowed. And, there, and there's a good deal, a growing body of data uh, to that effect. As a matter of fact, I, I don't know if it was uh, the Pew poll that you're you're thinking of in part, but it in fact uh, did ask uh, people uh, whether the government should be able to prevent people from saying offensive things, and there was a significant difference uh, in the results between, as the, polls, uh, the poll called it, baby boomers and, and millennials, with, uh, as you're suggesting, millennials being much more uh, willing to, uh, to restrict uh, free speech. Um, when, when you think of uh, the population of university campuses on the whole and the uh, demographic that most students fall into on a university campus, that would seem to be those 
who uh, are falling into that category of being much more willing to restrict speech. So is there a, a generational component to this, do you suppose? Uh, I think so. I, I pause because I can't help but think of uh, my generation, which went under the name the cool, not in the good sense, cool as in cold, uh, <laughs> generation. Uh, as to which, uh, I mean, when I arrived, I went to Cornell as an undergraduate. Uh, when I arrived there, they, they, they gave you like an ID card, which you had to sign to be able to go to class or anything, which basically said, I won't, I won't say anything or do anything that you find offensive, and I understand you can throw me out if I do. Uh, I mean, we're well, well rid of those days. Um, uh, and if, you know, if people in my generation were 90% for saying, we're all for free speech, but we never use it, uh, uh, you know, that would not especially uh, uh, speak well of them. But I do think that, that this is generational, and uh, it's, it's worth another lecture on why that is so, if it is so. Maybe a, a, a better way to uh, tap into what I'm after here is, do you suppose there's something in particular about college campuses that seems to attract, um, I don't want to say a propensity of violent protest against speakers, but we certainly have seen uh, an increase in it. Um, in this calendar year, for example. Oh, I don't know. It's, uh, college campuses haven't changed in the last 10 years. I mean, they are what they are. Uh, the, the, uh, have, the, have the views of the students changed? That seems to be the case. Uh, again, viewing this very broadly, uh, polls of this sort are not the best sort of polling data, but, but, but they do ask the same questions of, of people, you know, year after year after year. And we are seeing uh, more and more of a sense, I mean, to, to put it in, a, in a, a more kindly, less critical way, of students caring about each other and wanting to help their, their fellow students from being pained by, by speech which is at best antisocial. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, but, but it's, I, I, I don't think, uh, I really don't think that there's any doubt though that, that this is the direction uh, uh, in, in more recent days of, uh, of student opinion. Um, I, I know earlier today in a, in a separate setting, you, you said you're not here to make a political speech, and, and neither am I. Um, but <laughs> um, as, we, as we try to probe, uh, always watch the butt, right? Uh, as, as we try to probe possible uh, reasons uh, behind this, uh, I'm reminded of Professor Allison Stanger, who uh, was the professor who was injured at the Middlebury College incident uh, earlier this year, in injured in the melee uh, resulting from the uh, protests that turned violent. And she wrote a, a piece in, in the New York Times uh, where, where she talked about this, and she was trying to put her, her finger on, on what might be behind this. And just to quote a couple of uh, passages from her, she said, throughout an ugly campaign and into his presidency, President Trump has demonized Muslims as terrorists and dehumanized many groups of marginalized people. Uh, much of the free speech he has inspired or has refused to disavow is ugly and has already had ugly real-world consequences, and college students have seen this and taken notice. Um, do you suppose that this political uh, element has a bearing on campus speech? I, I think the level, the level of divisiveness that it either causes or at least encourages uh, is, is relevant to it. At the same time, though, uh, at least the polling data I've seen uh, showed a, a significant increase in the dire direction I was talking about 
well before President Trump was, was in office. I mean, it seems to me this is more a direction of the, of the thinking and uh, attitudes uh, of people. Uh, now, I mean, I will say, and I, I did in your class, that, that you know, uh, another example I could have chosen, and, and in my writing I have, uh, to make some of the points about the uniqueness of America is that the, the, the very thing that you adverted to, uh, what candidate Trump said about Muslims and what candidate Trump said about Mexicans would be criminal throughout most of Western Europe. Uh, uh, now, again, I, I don't think it should be. I don't think, uh, uh, I don't think we're well served you know, by, by having a body of law which results, as it has in some countries in Western Europe, with judicial decrees that someone may not run for office for 10 years, uh, which, which has been the result uh, of, of some of these cases. Uh, or, indeed, which cuts back on the ability to have a debate about public issues. Uh, in, in, uh, in England, for example, uh, a man was accused of and convicted of criminal conduct for having a poster showing the World Trade Center falling down uh, ablaze with, a, with large language about, on it saying, stop the Islamification of England. Now, saying stop the Islamification of England was, was taken to be hate speech. Uh, and the, the, the poster as a whole was taken to be an accusation that all Muslims were therefore responsible for 9-11. Uh, uh, I mean, one can reach whatever conclusions, and I certainly mine are very harsh uh, about the president and, and about these and other statements. Uh, but uh, I don't think a society benefits itself by going down the road of criminal law to, to deal with such matters. <clears throat> Clearly, when we talk about uh, speech on campus and, and violent uh, pro protests that may turn violent uh, against it, uh, you know, one of the things is one of the concerns for everyone, college administrators, students, parents uh, in particular, is safety. Um, and I'm, I'm reminded of the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, hearing uh, where you testified, uh, where Senator Feinstein uh, whose home state of California has been at the heart of a lot of this, uh, uh, talked about this. Uh, she, she cited what she called the battle for Berkeley. Um, and, and she asked, when does speech become an act of violence and when should it be stopped? Uh, in other words, where, where do we draw the line um, between speech that is uh, protected and acceptable uh, and that which which isn't, particularly well, on well, the, in the campus environment. Yeah. Let me say it's protected. It's not acceptable, uh, but 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 it is protected speech. Uh, I mean, that's a question to which there is a legal answer. I, I mean, it it's not hard to, to 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 give you the words at least which provide the answer. I mean, we have a concept of incitement, and and incitement, the only incitement. Which, which we treat as not protected by the First Amendment is uh, in, uh, the direct advocacy of violence with the intention that it occur and a high likelihood that it will occur. Uh, I mean, Justice Holmes wrote long ago, every idea is an incitement. Uh, so, you know, we have to be very careful uh, about very broad notions of speech causing this sort of misconduct uh, or that sort of misconduct. One of the things that I do think is, is, a, is a major problematic reality more and more on campus is that so long as people, you know, like me, people with the views I expressed and what, what I think the law is, have their way the answer is that universities are going to have to make choices, uh, and the choices can't be limited to uh, that speaker's okay and that speaker's not okay. And universities are going to have to be spending some of their 
precious and often very limited money getting security available. And university campuses will feel less free, less open uh, when, when you, what, have, have to have guards around uh, campus talks. But that is the direction that we're going in because so long as, you, as one says, as I just did, they must provide security. They, they can't say no to Mr. Spencer because students will react uh, uh, in, or outsiders will come and, and react in, in a manner so hostile that, uh, that security is needed. So we're going to wind up, I fear, needing more security in advance of controversial speakers than has ever been the case before. Mr. Abrams, you mentioned Robert Jackson in your opening remarks, and I wanted to take you back to a, the majority opinion he wrote in a case from 1943. It's one of my favorite Supreme Court cases, and I never get tired of reading it. It was, as you know, West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett. And I wonder if you could offer your thoughts as to where that fits in the pantheon of sure. Supreme Court First Amendment decisions. The, uh the Barnett case in, involved uh, a, uh, a girl who was a Jehovah Witness uh, who said that she could not salute the American flag <coughs> uh, because her religious beliefs were such that uh, they could not give allegiance to any entity uh, other than, than the, the God that they worshipped, and therefore could not and would not uh, salute the flag. Now remember, this is during World War II, so it is, it is a time when national unity was very much at uh, uh, center stage, uh, um, and uh, uh, the court, in a, a, a marvelous opinion of uh, Justice Jackson, rooted in the First Amendment religion clause, uh, freedom of r religion, uh, concluded that the, the school could not expel her. This is a public school now. The public school could not expel her because she refused to salute the flag. Uh, and he did it in exquisite language, which uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to try to uh, <laughs> uh, match uh, or, or repeat, but it, it is one of the great First Amendment opinions uh, in the history of the Supreme Court and written with a, with a special eloquence which uh, Justice uh, Jackson uh, uh, had and, and who, who may have been more eloquent uh, than, than any other su Supreme Court justice. Hi. Um, so specifically talking about large-scale large speeches from white nationalists, um, white supremacists, and the far right, um, and like I said, on a large scale, not just like, you know, person-to-person -person conversations, um, specifically thinking about that type of speech and the fact that a large majority of our government remains white, straight, and male, do you think, or I was wondering what your response would be to the argument that protecting that type of speech um, comes from a certain point of privilege um, because they know that that type of speech will never be directed towards them. Let me tell you how much I can give you in response to that question. I agree that that type of speech is not just painful, uh, but, but can be harmful to uh, 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 students who take it as a, a, a slur on them or their background. Uh, uh, that said, uh, I, I don't view it as a a question of privilege in the usual way that that term is used. Uh, um, uh, it is 
true that, that what should I say, simply waving a First Amendment flag is not an answer to, 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 to people who, who are deeply wounded by some of the speech that we're talking about and I'm talking about protecting. Uh, all I can say is that one has to have a more general approach to what sort of speech will be allowed and what not. Uh, and the more general approach that we have chosen, which is you know, a very broad uh, permission granted to the speech, is one which I think winds up helping uh, of people of privilege and people who are unprivileged. I think it winds up uh, helping minorities more than hurting uh, and helping people who are out rather than in because it's speech and free speech which has so often been the, the way that, that people who've been oppressed have been able to uh, overcome that. I'd even add to that that one of the consequences of limiting speech, and now I'm not talking about on campus, is very often the, the very sort of uh, uh, public explosion of discussion about it, which is not always helpful. I mean, in, in Weimar Germany, they had uh, speech restrictions uh, on hate speech, and Nazis were tried before they were in power and got big headlines because they made themselves into figures uh, who were being persecuted and whose speech rights were being taken away. Uh, and those statutes only did harm in that case. And I must say, when you look at how much time we're spending, as I just did, on Mr. Spencer, or how much time we're spending on speakers only because their views are so extreme that other people say, why do we allow that speech? That, that you know, there's, there, there's a quite strong argument that we would all be better off if no one showed up uh, and we just let creeps have their say and we go on with our lives. That's a great answer. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> may, may, may I interject something real quick here? Because you mentioned le legislation in Germany. What do you think about the efforts by some states here to uh, pass pro-campus speech laws? I get very nervous when states pass any laws. <laughs> uh, and when they pass laws dealing with the First Amendment, I get even more nervous. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, yes, it's the right direction, uh, uh, but, but uh, you know, to have the state legislatures that, that I know, uh, you know, start uh, walking around in, in the ballpark mm -hmm. of free expression, uh, uh, I, I think I'd rather just leave life the way it is. Mm -hmm. Mr. Abrams, could you address challenges to people who, on campus, who are opposing the Israeli occupation? Stephen Salita was fired from the University of Illinois for his Gaza, Gaza tweets. University of California Regents are debating proposals to oppose groups, address groups who support the BDS movement. Uh, the uh, Minnesota state legislature just passed a bill banning state vendors from boycotting Israel, and that's going to affect that bans, the law bans the state of Minnesota, including colleges and universities, from contracting with vendors boycotting Israel, requiring anyone who enters a contract worth more than $1,000 with the state to certify they will not engage in discrimination against Israel. Uh, my, my view is that the examples that you cited uh, differ from each other in, in significant ways. Uh, the last example, for example, uh, seems to me a statute which is perfectly constitutional. We have anti-boycott statutes already uh, with respect to uh, foreign countries not being 
uh, allowed to uh, boycott Israel and certain other allies at different times. Um, and I think that for a state to say our policy uh, is, uh, 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 is one where we choose not to do business with people who themselves engage in boycotts uh, is constitutional and uh, I think otherwise acceptable. I do think you're right though that some of the reaction to pro-Palestinian speech on campus um, and some to BDS speech on campus, but I'm talking about speech, uh, is overdone and unacceptable. Uh, I, I do think that said that some of the behavior of the BDS people uh, it, it also leaves something to be desired. Yeah. Mr. Abrams, this is more of a general free speech question. Um, I'm glad you brought up the um, case of the Westboro Baptist Church and their uh, warped reality. Um, in 2011, after the shooting of Representative Giffords in Tucson, there was um, legislation passed by the Arizona legislature that essentially created an artificial boundary between um, those that were protesting mainly geared toward those type of hate groups and the places of worship where the funerals of the victims of the Tucson shooting were taking place. I can't remember the exact distance, but um, I just wanted to ascertain your legal thought yeah. process on something like that. Some will say that it doesn't violate free speech, it just pushes them back a few yards, or is it contrary to the, um, the First Amendment um, at its core in that it's a slippery, uh, slippery right, slope right. between uh, creating a boundary and then ultimately banning the speech? I, I think you can push them back. Uh, uh, I, I think you can say, you can certainly say entering and leaving, but I think bigger than that, uh, uh, around uh, churches, other places of worship, and, and the like, uh, uh, so as not to interfere with the people mourning, uh, it would be very likely constitutional and should be. Um, obviously, uh, I mean, in the Westboro Baptist Church, it was, it was a thousand yards. It's quite a distance. Uh, and it was far enough away so the father didn't see it. He saw it on television, which you could say makes a difference too. It did make a difference to the court, by the way. Um, so, you know, I, the, it, it, it's, a, it's a good general question, but the, the answer to it is gonna be intensely factual about how far and how near and the like, but I do think those are things the legislature can properly take into account. Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Abrams. Um, this evening you've cited a lot of examples of uh, counter speech against um, mostly like white nationalists and those figure, figures <clears throat> on campuses and mostly about how those counter speech uh, protests, or not really counter speech, but those demonstrations are not really in alignment with our First Amendment. Um, and kind of particularly citing that people of my generation, the millennial generation, are sort of taking things or acting upon them in a way that's not in alignment with the law. And so therefore, I would say puts any people who are trying to counter protest in a poor situation, legally speaking. Um, I was wondering if you could cite some examples of successful counter speech, similar to, I think you mentioned one at Harvard, of students turning their back and walking out as something that can be done. Right. So, right. do you have more examples? Let me say first, counter speech is perfectly acceptable. I was talking literally about shutting down events by, by the noise or the, or the the, the, the heckling and the like, even heckling. Uh, certainly signs, uh, certainly very public expressions of distaste and contempt for the speaker are entirely proper and constitutional uh, and well within First Amendment boundaries. 
the, 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 the two areas where it gets, where the answer becomes the opposite are one where the counter speech amounts to violence, which is, you know, just a different area almost. Uh, but, but the other mm -hmm. is when the counter speech keeps the speech from occurring. But subject to that, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's open, open field. Uh, if someone wants to give speeches like that, he has to take the chance, what, that people will disagree and say so in a serious way? And, and, I, I, and I don't mean that it, it, ha it always has to be quiet, and, it, you know, I'm not talking about decorum or, you know, or politesse or wh whatever. Uh, I, I'm, people can be heard, they can walk out, they can, they can have signs. Uh, I mean, the other suggestion I made is the one which could be most effective but is uh, almost psychically impossible if you're upset enough about someone saying these outrageous things. And that is try to, try to persuade no one to come, you know. I mean, leave just <clears throat> a few racists there. Uh, but I, I can't begin to tell you uh, how, to, how to get there. But all the other things I think are fine. Okay, thanks. Probably have time for one more, sir. It's not entirely fully thought out, but I want to react to what I think uh, was a very helpful reminder that you gave us that a public university is not legally obligated to be, as you described it, a public park, to be a place where anybody can say anything. And I just wonder if you think maybe a more affirmative case might be made for that position. Could a university president, its deans, and most importantly, its faculty say, we want to recover our prerogative to determine what ideas are going to be put out to the students in the name of the university, not to silence the students' debate of those ideas, but to say that only the ideas that the educators think are important for students to learn is what we're going to sponsor on campus. Or would, would you be concerned that that would unnecessarily chill freedom of thought and opinion? And look, uh, it wouldn't surprise me, first of all, if we do go in that direction, and the direction, the way I think of it, is a direction of, of saying we are a university of uh, learning and research uh, and teaching. Uh, we don't allow people to interrupt our teaching. You're not allowed in the classroom. Uh, I mean, this is, this is not a completely open, uh, as I said, it's not a park. Uh, um, um, and therefore, and here it does get difficult vis-a-vis -vis what students want and what students may be right in wanting, which is more of a chance to hear public debate about public issues, even though it does not fit within any of the, the purely educational uh, 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 areas that, 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 that I've talked about. And, and there are very serious people, Robert Post, the former dean of Yale Law School, who believes very strongly that a university ought to redefine itself uh, in, in those, more, those pure, more purely academic and research terms. Um, and, and this is all my language now, not his. Keep the politicians away uh, and keep the real world away. You know, go somewhere else if, if you want to go listen to them. Uh, but, I mean, but if a student came to me and said, what would you think of that? I'd say, I, I think it's, it's good for you to hear these people, that you really do learn by hearing, and I, I don't just mean the bad people. Uh, uh, <clears throat> it, it's good for you to, to, to have access to a very wide range of non-academic and non-academic topics, views on matters of public interest. Uh, but again, I can see universities confronted more and more 
with, with what, risks of violence because they have to allow some Nazi to, get, to give a speech, starting to say, you know, we'll, we'll give up this and that and that and that. Tell the students, go somewhere else. Uh, I, I could really see that happening. <clears throat> well, as you can see, this is a uh, multi-layered issue. Uh, we've only been able, I think, to, to pr uh, probe into a few of them. Uh, but, uh, but I think we've, uh, Mr. Abrams has done a, a wonderful job uh, uh, in helping us sort through this as much as we can in the time that we had. I know Paul has, uh, has uh, one more thing that, uh, yes. that he wants to share. <clears throat> I have uh, just a brief token of our thanks to Mr. Abrams for coming all the way across the country to do this. Uh, the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership believes in great debates and great works and books, and we also believe in great bottles because we are in Arizona <laughs> and we need water bottles. So as a mm -hmm. small token of appreciation for your effort Thank you. and for Thank your you. remarks. Thank you very much.